Hey everybody, welcome back to Bruce's Bees. We are here with Corey Stevens from Stevens Bee Company up in Missouri. And I've been wanting to talk to Corey a while about what he's doing up there. So Corey, why don't you introduce yourself, kind of tell us where you're from and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing. Sure, I'm from Dexter, Missouri originally. I worked in the transportation industry while I was going, working on my bachelor's degree and all, and uh, got into bees, you know, kind of when we were starting a family. And uh, I've been at it for, I'm thinking around 15 years, something like that, 14, 15 years. <clears throat> but, you know, a little background, I got obsessed with queen rearing and genetics about my third year of beekeeping, started raising my own queens, and I was ordering Tom Glenn VSH Italians back in the day, breeder queens. Actually, before I even knew how to raise a queen, I ordered one, which was kind of put in the cart before the horse, but... You could see how obsessed I was with it then. Uh, I think 2013, I got an EAS Master Beekeeper certification. 2014, I went and learned instrumental insemination from Sue Kobe. Again, that, that obsession with genetics was uh, maybe a little over the top. Sorry to my wife for that. She was trying to keep me from going off the deep end. But... We've got a couple kids. My youngest six is 16 now, so we're getting close to, you know, having an empty nest possibly, which is kind of weird. But we own Stevens Bee Company, and uh, like we're going to talk about a lot here, our main focus is selecting for mite and disease resistance, because even back whenever I first started bees, that's all everybody was talking about then, too, is how bad the Varroa were and how much it affected their bees and how you know, out of control it was. So I think that's why I got fixated on that because, you know, I know we have treatments and I know we have this stuff too, but I think we overlook that host resistance part of IPM almost all the time. I mean, as I'm in an ag community as farmers, we overlook it too. You know, I say we, I'm not a farmer, but I've, I've helped my cousin and uncles out on their farms and whatnot. It's an important piece, and I think, that, you know, as people start chattering about amitraz resistance or having not as good an efficacy on some of their treatments, I think it just reminds us of how important this aspect of it is. Before we got on, I talked to you a little bit about this is going to be like some beekeeping for dummies, uh, beekeeping 101, you know, BSH 101, et cetera. So I'm going to try and keep it pretty basic. I know. I've heard you talk before, man. You have all the the scientific stuff down. I know you have a degree in entomology, correct? And so, yeah, I finished up a master's in entomology, um, basically over COVID. Whenever that was going on, I was uh, just hammering it as hard as I could, and graduated with a four point zero, which I was proud of because I can't say the same for my bachelor's degree. I wasn't <laughs> nearly as focused on that. I was working full time too and going to school full time, so. That's awesome. Yeah, I didn't have a 4.0 then. <laughs> so I'm sure in our discussion today, we'll use some different acronyms and, and maybe if we could define those up front as to exactly what they are. So let's dive right in here. You know, I, I know that there is a lot of talk out there about VSH. Um, and I see, I've started seeing on advertisements for different queen breeders, hygienic queens. I see that everywhere. I don't know how they can claim that, if there's any type of certification for that, but I know that I see that. But let's just start off basically with, if you could define a couple of terms. Yep. Um, and I know there's been some debate on this, and, and I heard you recently did a video on your channel where you had a, a couple of young ladies on there, and you were talking about definition of VSH, and that yep. kind of that kind of actually clued me into doing this interview. I've actually been thinking about talking to you for a while. We discussed a little bit at Hive Life, but when I saw that video, I just realized there's still so much confusion out there. Oh, yeah. So, Corey, I'm going to ask you straight up front, um, what exactly is VHS? As you noticed in that video, there's still in the academic community. Of course, we keep learning more things. It's not like we know it all. You know, every few years we'll learn something else. But it seems like the literature is just kind of going in all kinds of different directions. And I think some of it, you know, they're saying what someone else said is not necessarily new research and I feel like they're muddy in the water more than they're clarifying clearing the water so my intent with that conversation was to clear the water whether I did that or not I don't know or if I just made it muddier but 
in the late 90s, the USDA ARS Ag Research B Lab in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, they knew we were getting just <laughs> schwacked with Varroa. So they were tasked with finding, find some resistance, you know, find some genes that are actually doing something for uh, Varroa infestation. So they found, it was just a small sample. I think it was like 10 or 13 colonies or something that were, you know, purported as mite resistant. Something was up with them. Something positive was going on, but they didn't know what it was. So they went in there <clears throat> and they figured out that those bees were suppressing mite reproduction. So whenever they get in there and they start pulling a bunch of pupae out and you find, you know, a foundress mite and then she'll have males and a, another female or two in there, there, she's reproducing. So whenever that brood emerges, those fertile mites are just propagating. They go into another cell and repeat and repeat. That's what, how our mite loads just skyrocket. So they called it SMR, and which is suppressed mite reproduction. They didn't know how they were doing it, but the bees were shutting down mite reproduction. So then it may have been Marla Spivak, maybe, up in University of Minnesota, but she figured out that how they were suppressing it is they were sniffing these mites out. They would find the ones that were reprodu reproducing, uncap it, and throw the pupae out. Well, that's high, a hygiene response. So then they changed it to VSH or Varroa sensitive hygiene. But my argument was with that is, and this is where I start stepping on toes because it's not, I guess not everybody abides by the same definition or tests. You know, some people alcohol wash their bees and select from the lowest, which is a good approach, but it doesn't measure, measure VSH. Like to measure VSH, you're going into your bees, you're pulling a frame of brood that's about to come out. You're uncapping a minimum of 100. You might have to do more to get a definitive result. And if you just treated, you're not going to get a good result. You want your mite loads to build. And then you go in there and you're basically measuring the bee's ability to suppress mite reproduction. Technically, that's how you're measuring VSH. What and does that look like when you pull that back? Are there no mites in there? Or what does that look like inside the... It, it depends. It totally depends. Like if you go into a random subset of bees that aren't selected for VSH and probably even some of the ones that are saying they are, if you go in there and measure them with that Harbo assay, you can find it online. That's John Harbo. He's the one that found out or figured out SMR VSH. You can go to his website. Uh, if you Google Harbo Bee Company. Um, How do you spell Harbo? H-A-R-B-O. And if you Google that, there'll be a tab that says VSH. And if you click on it, there'll be a thing that comes up that says a measure VSH, and it tells you exactly what to do. And I mean, I thought you had to have a white coat, you know, <laughs> a lab to figure this stuff out. But me and some friends, uh, you know, that were some folks that were working with me at Missouri State Beekeepers on the past president of Missouri State Beekeepers, but whenever we'd have them down and just have fun and hang out, go to a rodeo or whatever. But I was like, Hey, we're going to, here's what we're going to do. We're going to figure this out. And so we did. And I mean, it's pretty straightforward. You don't have to have a white lab coat or a PhD behind your name to figure it out. So we just started measuring it, which I was already raising Queens and already had instrumental insemination. So then we just took that data of the high score in colonies and I'd catch drones out of them and then repeat, you know, inseminate our daughters. So our scores just kept going up. But a lot of talk about this. <clears throat> Again, I think there's confusion in the industry to where some people were testing kind of for this, you know, this applies to USDA B lab, you know, higher level breeding programs and international breeding programs. You know, some of them have come up with purported VSH. And then I heard feedback of how they did. And they may have been high VSH, but they weren't. You know, if you had them, Bruce, they wouldn't be your favorite bees. They wouldn't be the ones that stacking up honey supers and stuff. So that, I guess that's where my approach diff, diff, differs from theirs, is I want high VSH. But I want something that's going to put honey in the supers and that's commercially useful. Otherwise, what's the point? 
you know, as far as a beekeeping perspective. I mean, you want something that's host resistant, but at the same time, it's not going to make you any honey. You're not making any money anyway. So what's the point of having it? You know, it's got to make sense. Yeah, that's interesting because, and here's another thing you hear all kinds of people say, well, hygienic bees just pull everything out or they just, they're, they get, they're mean or after yeah. a generation or two, they lose their gentle nature. And so mm -hmm. you hear all these things. And, and one thing I pulled out of the interview that you did with Nathan from Duck River Honey is that you want to create a bee that, as you just said, is hygienic, um, that has these tendencies, these uh, traits, but also can be used uh, for the various aspects of beekeeping out there, honey production, pollination, all the different things that, are, that make it a beneficial bee for the, for what people normally want. Now, if you just want to have, I guess when you say they won't, you can't stack honey supers up, you mean they just don't grow real big? Is that yeah. what you're saying? They just kind of, they survive, but they don't grow real big. And I've had bees right. like that, but you know, if you're just pollinating your garden or something, that's fine. But mm -hmm. if you're, if you want to really make money or if you want to turn it into a business or be super successful in traditional beekeeping things you got to be able to have bees that grow into nice large colonies that that can build up that you can stimulate to build up uh, yeah. for different purposes such as pollination and or honey production and so that's one thing that kind of caught my eye you know i'm just being in the position i'm in you hear all kinds of stuff you you and you just hear kind of the horror stories of the quote unquote hygienic clean mm -hmm. bees another thing that that i was when you talk about that test i know i've seen a lot of people when tested for hygienic uh tendencies or traits they will take the i guess it's the they'll put like a pie like a pipe or a tube on there with the is it what do they put on the liquid nitrogen and they kill yeah. and then they see if the bees drag out that brew that's right. one test correct that is that's, correct. that's 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 not what you're talking about though no but here's the deal too like whenever we say hygiene or we say vsh you know, VSH is a form of hygiene, and this, whenever you, some people say FKB or free, freeze killed brood, that's the liquid nitrogen you're talking about. Okay. Whenever you use that as a selection tool, what they've found is, it's scientifically proven, <clears throat> that they will be hygienic, but that doesn't equal mite resistance necessarily. It can. Now, you're not going to, you shouldn't see American foul brood. You should see reduced brood issues, but there's something additional like these traits are, you would call it John Harbo called them an additive trait set. So basically you could have Bruce's favorite bees and with some breeding work, you can select to have Bruce's bees that are VSH. <clears throat> That's why I called mine Missouri mite hunters. I called it the line because I originated in Missouri and I'm specifically selecting for the ones that are productive in VSH. So the point of me saying that is, Hygiene is a good testing mechanism, but I feel like testing them for VSH is Varroa specific. This is more of a general hygiene, keeping generally keep the brood nest clean. And that's what's cool, I think, about Kara Wagner's work. I don't know if you've caught any of that coming out of University of North Carolina, Greensboro. She's caught, came up with a new test called UBO, and it's uh, they synthesized basically they concentrated i guess you'd call it like stress pheromones from the brood and in, in a spray and the same thing they use a little circle piece and pss, spray it on top of the brood and then they come back two hours later and see who uncapped everything because mm -hmm. the ones that can smell it and know something's wrong they open them up to see what's going on with the brood so that's like a better form of hygiene and the reason i say better form it's because I think the, that UBO is getting into VSH territory. You've got the hygiene, but it's Varroa specific. And she showed that with scientific testing. They're more likely to survive if they score 60% or higher. And she even went to, so far to say on an IPM perspective, a lot of those colonies didn't need to be treated. They kept the mites low enough, which that's a lot for an academic to say that. Um, they kept the loads low enough that there wasn't enough mites there to justify a treatment economically. So where we are on that spectrum, you know, I lean towards the VSH side, but we're actually testing that UBO on our breeding stock this year um, to see how it compares and, you know, see, see what the data says, basically. 
the, it won't be available commercially till 2024. And then other people can, if they like it and it's working well, they can purchase it then, I believe. Um, speaking of IPM, define that term. IPM. <clears throat> IPM is integrated pest management. So it's a data driven approach. Oh. It's a very, very smart approach. But the thing is, it's not just bees. You can apply it to soybeans, corn, cattle, any kind of anything that we're producing or growing, you know, for our benefit, it's a living organism. They're going to be prone to pests and pathogens and whatnot. So with the IPM, <clears throat> the focus is, is to sample. So if anybody's doing alcohol washes, that's IPM. You're sampling to see how high your Varroa loads are. And then they set a threshold. And if it's over this, it makes sense money wise. Like if you don't treat, you're going to start losing money. That's why that threshold is there. <clears throat> but it's gotten to where the threshold, you know, I've heard some people go, well, one mite. If there's one mite in there, you need to treat. I'm like, yeah, exactly. What that tells me is your bees have zero resistance. So if you don't have a hundred percent chemical control on that, they're going to get their launch aid. You know, like you said, when you got honey supers on and you can't treat and they're raising brood the whole time, they're just building up a mite farm basically. So yeah. the reason why VSH and some of that stuff is so important, it could be another trait set. There's, and there's probably stuff we don't know yet. But the reason that's so important is because the bees are fighting for themselves. They're not, you're not a hundred percent relying on amateurs and you're not a hundred percent relying on oxalic or anything. It's a tool in the toolkit is what I say, a really effective tool. So it's not like they won't get mites. They will, they're bees. They just limit mite reproduction is the thing, but there's more to it than that. Because whenever I started using VSH, whenever I was a, a youngster, didn't know what I was doing other than I figured out how to raise queens. I thought I had it all figured out. But I'd go in, I'd see a colony, and you've probably seen it, Bruce, where they've got withered wings. You know, their wings look like two little pieces of yarn. <clears throat> That's a deformed wing virus. Well, I, would, I found if I didn't treat that colony and it was ate up with it, but had resources, you know, to where you could potentially save it, I would switch the queen out with a VSH queen, not treat them, not do anything, and then come back and keep looking at them. And about six to eight weeks later, they look like a, you wouldn't have recognized them. Bruce, there wasn't a single bee in there with parasitic or withered wings, parasitic mite syndrome. They completely cleaned it up. And this was over and over and over. If that queen took and they made it through their tough spot, they would be completely cleaned up. So I knew they had viral resistance. Well, Kara's work, back to Kara, big, huge fan of hers. She found out too, and that's the, she's the first one I've heard really say it forthrightly. They've hinted around it in scientific literature, but she said these things are viral resistant. So basically, she's seeing the same thing. That's why I think that there's hygiene, there's VSH, and I think UBO is like somewhere between selecting for VSH and like hyper hygiene. So it's like hygiene on steroids. So I'm, I'm pretty hopeful about it. And I think it's cool that she said the same thing I've said, because I wasn't a scientist at the time. I was just a crazy person raising a lot of queens and using stock nobody around me was using. But that's repeated. You know, I haven't put anything, again, I don't promote this, but I haven't put any miticides on my bees in the last decade just because I'm breeding for mite resistance. I haven't seen a single bee with parasitic mite syndrome. And you, I mean, you can't tell me that's not because of that. Cause we have mites. They're pretty much everywhere. But I also had Randy Oliver request samples. You may have heard me mention that too. In another talk, he was wanting to test viral levels of deformed wing virus. And he wanted bees that hadn't been treated yet. I imagine so they could go, Oh my God, look at the, high levels of deformed wing virus here, but it, we, we got the opposite. I, they tested for A, B, and C, and I had below quantifiable levels, below quantifiable levels, and none. And that was out of bees that hadn't had anything put on them. Now, I'm not migratory, Bruce, so you know as well as I do, if you're moving bees, you're going to probably get into areas where you got higher pressure. Or, and the thing is, even if you got really heavy VSH bees, you might get in an area where your mite load skyrocket. 
Now they are viral resistant and they will shut down reproduction, but still, man, I mean, those little buggers will cause problems. Well, that's where you go back to IPM. You know, don't just say, well, I got VSHBs. I never have to treat again. You know, I I wouldn't say that. Now they're going to be a lot hardier. They are resistant, but you need to fall back if you're getting alcohol washes that are just ungodly. Man, you probably need to go back and clean them up with something. You know, uh, that's awesome stuff, Matt. This is one thing I like about, about your approach and, and a lot of people that I've been talking to lately and with, for various things, you know, I had a Tom Nolan on the channel recently, just, it's a tool in the toolkit. Yeah. I mean, it's a re it's something we can, we can use and think about and, and you're realistic about this thing. You're not saying never treat ever. You're not saying just let your bees sit out there and die. You know, yeah. it's not natural selection where it's just the, uh, you know, survival of the fittest, like a lot of, like, I think quote unquote treatment free beekeepers are like get 10 hives. Don't ever treat, let them do their thing. And then the ones that survive, then split them. And eventually you may get there, but man, it's just, it's just not realistic. I don't think for most people to do that. So I totally agree. And most of them aren't paying attention to their genetics either. They're just getting a random subset of bees and hoping that a resistance pops out of them, you know, yeah, work that cut, way. Wow. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I haven't treated my bees in a decade, but don't, I'm not saying you should use this as a management style, like warning, you know, this yeah. is not what most people need to do. This is specific to breeding and it's easy to do more harm than good. I think that's how you got to look at it. Like, am I fixing a problem? Am I actually breeding? Am I actually selecting something? Or my bees just kind of getting tore up and, you know, we're just, hoping something happens and they pull through and then we can split from them. I don't think that's a good approach necessarily. One thing that you just accidentally, I think hit on something that I've been trying to emphasize lately. We've been mentioned it some in the stream team lives we've done and I'm kind of, my channel is going to take this direction a little bit. That's one reason I want to do some of these interviews is start using the term intentional beekeeping. That's a term that I really like. Um, it's, it's, this exactly what you just defined without knowing it is that so many people, and I've been this way in the past are random with what they're doing as, as a new beekeeper, that's a kind of a necessary thing. Cause you got to figure it out. There is some randomness that goes into it, but as you develop your skills and you kind of see what direction you want to go, you have to become intentional with what you're doing. Now you're taking it to a much higher level. Like my job is what I want to do is learn from you to not have to do everything you've done. That's one reason I do this channel and do these interviews is, to learn from someone who's, who's put in the work who, in your case, who that's kind of, that's your sweet spot. That's, mm-hmm. that's your calling, so to speak. Right. So I don't have to do all that, but, but I can learn from you. And, and if I want to do some of that, you can teach me how, and I appreciate that. So, um, you just, you just basically define intentional beekeeping without intentionally doing it. So I appreciate that. <laughs> awesome. Quick, quick review. I want to go back through the acronyms and I think we've talked about four so far we talked about i guess ipm is kind of the the basic and then we got we have the smr yep vh v s h i told yep. you to do that <laughs> and then what was the last one with the u the research is doing you what U-B-O. it stands for unhealthy brood odor that's kara's yeah. say that she came up with okay so ipm equals what go through them one ypm is what ipm equals integrated pest management Okay. That's, a, that's the data driven approach where we're taking alcohol washes and we establish a threshold threshold. So like if I'm getting fours, five, sixes on my washes, you know, at some point, wherever your threshold is, you're going to just treat like we're over that, knock them down. Cause okay. economically, if you don't knock them down, you're going to lose money. SMR is suppressed mite reproduction. Suppressed. Yeah. What I say is basically to measure VSH you're technically measuring SMR. You're measuring your bees' ability to suppress mite reproduction. So if you get in there and you're pulling a whole bunch out, one example I give is I pulled 100 pupae out and I found five non-reproductive mites. So they couldn't, ha- they didn't have babies. How can you tell they're non-reproductive? If there's just a foundress mite in there. You can like tell I'm, the difference by looking yeah. at them? Well, just by counting them even. So whenever they're about to emerge, they've had every chance. If they're going to reproduce, they had already done it. 
that's whenever I'm pulling them out. You know, okay. they're they're past purple eyed even. They're starting to get pigment to them. So if you have one mite in a cell in that situation, you know that that mite has been suppressed. Like they can't reproduce. Well, if she don't have babies, yeah. But the yeah. thing is, you have to look at it. Like John Harbo says, about 16 or 18 percent of mites just don't have babies. You know, just like people or you know sure. any kind of organism. Some of us can't do it. So. If it's over that 16% or so that's found in nature, the bees are doing something. And a lot of the stuff that I'm using is 100% suppressed mite reproduction. So we'll go through a whole yard and find a bunch of mites, but we may only find out of all those colonies a couple that reproduced. And they're culls. Like as soon as I see babies in there, they're out. But I'm, okay. I'm crazy about it because okay. I'm concentrate these genes that way we talked about muddying like you said like you might lose it i'm trying to give you the highest scoring vsh possible that way if you graft out of a daughter and graft out of a daughter like you said it could get muddy but it depends are you testing for it are you selecting the daughters that you want to breed from test them and then pick the ones that score highest if you're actually selecting for it even if you're open mating bruce you'll keep a high level of it in your bees so the thing is, is yeah, it can go almost completely away, but it don't, it doesn't have to, but you got to put the work in you sure. know, the work in and keeping the pressure on it. It'll probably get muddy. VSH means Varroa. Sensitive hygiene. Okay. So it's a hygienic mechanism, but they're targeting reproductive Varroa mites. Okay. Is That's that what the is SMR that... ties into it? Because the SMR measurement gives you a VSH score. So the SMR measurement gives you the VHS score, or VSH yeah. score. So that's what I think the big confusion is, is they think VSH means hygiene. That's that people just, they hear the word hygiene yep. and they don't, they kind of leave off the VS part of it. And right. so, or, or maybe they don't leave it off, but they think if they hear hygienic bees, someone says, I've got hygienic bees. Odds are there's a good chance they're probably doing the liquid nitrogen field. test and yep. the bees are hygienic. They could very well be hygienic, but right. the question is... Are they testing for varroa sensitivity as well? Yep. So that's so the difference. If they, if they say, I've got hygienics, that means they probably use freeze-killed brood. But that, that according to scientific literature, they may or may, or may not, not be varroa resistant. So you've taken your research to just a different, just a deeper level is what you've done, basically. Yeah, and I've got a narrow focus. You know, if you get way out on other stuff. You know, I probably lose some effectiveness. This is just what I've been obsessed over for, you know, well over a decade. So I've read. And, and then the other term was UBO, which is kind of a newer term. And yeah, let's find that again. Unhealthy brood odor. It's basically mm -hmm. brood stress pheromones is how I look at it. And she's finding the ones that respond quickly to it. It's like it's better than hot, than freeze killed brood because this is varroa specific. So now we're back into they have measurable varroa resistance and viral resistance too. Yeah, that's awesome. So, uh, so now that's the thing, Bruce. Like, do we know everything about all this stuff? No. Do we know enough to breed effective, useful, commercially useful bees? Yes, we do. <laughs> you know, that's we're awesome. finally getting it together. It took a while. You know, we have to feel around where they say a blind hog finds an acre and every now and then, you know, I think we're finally just now getting to pay dirt here. <laughs> yeah, man, it's, it's, we've been going for 30 minutes, man. It's so, it's just so interesting to me. And so, uh, you know, I'll probably post this thing the full length and then I may break it into three or four different segments so cool. people can watch shorter clips, but so it's more digestible. So I think we've talked a lot about, these are a lot of questions that I had about exactly what does VSH mean? And I've heard you talking about these things and just haven't really understood it, but I, I hope we've gotten drilled down a little bit between this video and other videos other folks have done to where me beekeeping 101 can kind of understand a little better about what's going on i think we've clarified some things there that are critical when you see a queen breeder that says you know um abc bee company we sell hygienic queens what right. does that mean and and maybe maybe they have some of your stock who knows maybe they've ordered from you but the thing yeah. is you know what does that mean and um so I don't know if you need to ask the queen breeder or just understand that it may or may not be varroa sensitive hygiene. Yeah. Um, and, and if you see VSH queens, hopefully that means that they are truly 
the SH queens um, right. that they have come from a reliable source or that their genetics start from that that source. And sometimes they're not. Yeah, I know. Say it. And it could be because they just grafted out of daughters too much or wasn't testing for it. Maybe they started yeah. with it, but it got weaker, like we talked about. Yeah. So if you have any questions over that, go back to that Harbo assay because you can measure it yourself. Okay. One more defined term before we move on. I okay. hear you use the word assay. First yeah. of all, spell it. And what does that mean? A-S-S-A-Y. It's basically okay. a test. It's just a fancy word for test. So BSA okay, okay. test, or that whenever I say UBO assay, it's a UBO test. You're just okay. testing them or okay. spraying that, you know, whatever the testing protocol may be. Okay. So it's just We've got, in, in the medical field, in my real day, you know, full-time job, we have a lot of, of medical terms that really translate to a very simple term like assay equals test we have things that equal whatever and in our in our documentation we have to use the long word the fancy yeah. word but when we're talking like this we break it down and, and keep it you got to break it down to a layman layman level and so that's exact i'm glad you defined that because i i've heard you and other people i think i've heard greg talking about assays yeah and i didn't know for sure what yeah. that meant i you know yeah. to me assay sounds like something chromosomal or something genetic but it's actually yeah. just a test so that helps a lot yeah okay let's let's kind of move forward a little bit um cory i'd like to talk a little bit about the beekeeping industry as a whole like for example how yeah. can i benefit from what you're doing what can how can your stock help me in my operation what would you recommend i do if i want to if i want to kind of incorporate some of these principles into my situation certainly I think it has measurable results, which is key, because I think a lot of scientists talk and, oh, well, this could work, or this could work, or the bees can do this. But if we can't measure it and put it in our own bees, it just sounds cool. You know, I want something that moves, something that actually works for you. So what I would say is if you use my stock, well, okay, I'll give an example of one of my buddies. He runs about a thousand colonies does uh, maybe slightly less than that, does almond pollination, honey production, nuke and queen production, the whole gamut. He started using my stock about three years ago, buying breeder queens. And it, from what he posted on commercial beekeepers, I think it was on an, a thread where Ian Stepler shared a recorded conversation uh, that I had done. I don't know if it was with Dr. Peck and them or which one it was, but anyway, that doesn't matter. He said, the bees seem to be keeping lower mite loads. I don't have to treat as much. He said, my honey production has increased. My winter survival is better. So he's having more colonies make it through winter. And he said that is eight frame, I guess they measure it by frame average. His percentage of colonies that make grade for almonds has gone up since using my breeder queens. So does he never have to treat for mites? No. You know, you need to pay attention to that. Are you in an area that has high pressure? You might need to knock them down. If you're in an area with low pressure, you may not have to do anything at all. But that goes back to measuring it. See where you're, if you actually have a problem or not before you treat. But overall, that's my goal, man. And I, I've done that in my spare time because I have a day job like you, Bruce. I, I'm a senior logistics guy for Nestle Purina. So I have to deal with uh, transportation chaos all day but i'm looking to make a transition to breeding full time so my breeder queens are limited this year otherwise i would say if you're a big operation and you want to implement these genes get breeder queens and raise a bazillion queens out of it and just run those queens and select from the best okay. and you're going to see measurable results is it a cure-all no i don't think it's a cure-all but i also know that obviously by hearing it from the horse's mouth of somebody who's actually doing it, almond pollination in the works that overall he's seen big improvement. And the thing is too, is if you can calculate it to more bees making qualification to go to almonds, more honey, you've got less dead bees. That's money, man. That's, that's the whole point is to have something measurable to show you results that, you know, we're moving in the right direction. Whatever I spent on that breeders breeder, which Man, that's another thing I've got to work out because I was I was selling them for like two fifty, and then I bumped it to three fifty, and now I have it a day job, but I found myself shrinking back from that because it just wasn't as profitable as I'd like it to be. But you know, I sell buku amount of virgin queens, which that's a whole nother 
that was my next question. Like, you know, for example, someone who may not want to do raise their own Queens or do yeah. or graft or whatever. I, I first heard this. I didn't realize that you didn't just sell made at Queens. I always thought I kind of thought you did. So I, I, I know that you sell, you sell cells, yep. Virgin Queens and yep. breeder Queens. And right. so just say, for example, I wanted to, I wanted to get, more stock, like say from Greg and maybe Jose, some just some different people that we've heard of, just what it just queen breeder A or B or C. But I wanted to um, also have your genetics involved, kind of combine and create a little. Is is it is would it be a good thing to do to maybe go ahead and have some stock I like and then introduce some of your virgins into the mix and they could. Is that yes. kind of what the idea is? If for for someone who can't afford to buy a bunch of breeder queens or several breeder queens. It, would you suggest purchasing some cells or virgins and then putting them in your, and then letting your drones yep. across uh, now th here's another question that I have about that. Do the traits hold when you do that? Because you're, you're mixing the, the genes up at quite a bit with my stock locally. Would it, would the traits, the desirable traits hold as yep. far as the VSH, as well as the desirable traits from the drones, does it kind of mix and typically last more than just a generation or two? Uh, yes, it does. Definitely. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, too, is like if you're not selecting for it and you just quit quit buying it or quit using it, the thing is, is selecting for it. So if you don't want to do the selecting selection work, I'm happy to do that for you for a price. But I also am happy to train you on how to do that yourself because you might come out with a Alabama strain of VSH that's Bruce's, you know, that works exclusively in his area really well. It's a little bit different than mine, which is a beautiful thing because we don't want inbreeding. You know, that's a problem if everybody's getting their bees from this one source you, you could run into inbreeding issues which again that's yeah. a whole nother discussion and most of the time most beekeepers don't have to worry about inbreeding especially if you're using my stock because we've got so much gen genetic diversity in there due to the breeding model that i use that it's, you have to work you have to try to get inbreeding but yeah. the, your question was if you're using virgins from me Will that affect that population and how will it hold? Absolutely. Harbo's got research out on if you open made it to non VSHBs, is that colony still resistant? Absolutely. And not only is that colony resistant, all, like you said, all the drones that they're producing are going to be resistant drones. So if you queen a whole yard with these virgin queens or cells, that whole yard is doing nothing all year long but putting out VSH drones. So I've caught swarms locally around me that weren't from my colonies and I tested them and they tested high, which makes sense because they're out, they're breeding with my bees. Now, if you just buy a few and then graft, you know, you've got your 10th generation and you never tested for it. Can it get muddy? Absolutely. Oh, just sure. like anything, you could lose gentle behavior and then start to get aggressive. They could start to not produce as much honey. It's all genetic, same thing. So, so speaking of the attitude of the bees, um, that's another concern or something else that I've heard is that, and I don't know if in this particular case we were talking about VSH or hygienic, I, I don't know, I can't remember, but that within a couple of generations, the attitude declines when you do yeah. that. Have you know, is that true? Is that a true statement or is that just yeah, kind it, of a... It can totally happen. I know there was one area I was open mating in, I don't know what local bees they had around there but each subsequent generation it seemed like it got more aggressive now the thing is too is sometimes if you make an unrelated cross like whenever i crossed my bees with john harbo's like tip tip top vsh scores because i wanted to get my vsh scores up and there was a fraction of those things that they weren't for newbies you know if you didn't know how to handle bees you'd give them a bad report card for for uh temperament you know, if you're banging around in there, you're in there when it's cold or there's a thunderstorm moving in, they, did, they didn't uh, tolerate it too well without getting a few in your face. But the thing is, too, is after you keep breeding past that, it goes the opposite direction. Like, I, you know, I did the same thing years ago with a Purdue cross, which I, the, that didn't go the way I wanted it to. So I just got rid of that line. But I had to wear gloves. I usually don't wear gloves, Bruce, but I keep a pair handy in case I got to get in there when it's not opportune. You know, I had to get gloves. Some of the Harbo ones were a little bit crabby, not as bad as the ones as the Purdue ones for some reason. But now I, I don't, I'm become an isolationist. I haven't brought anything in in a few years and I'm just using what I've got. 
And if they're super crabby, you know, I'll cull those out. So I don't know. I have to. Rem- I don't remember what came and he tried a bunch of cells and he's got a breeder too. And uh, he rated them slightly, I wouldn't even say more aggressive, slightly more aggressive maybe than what he had originally, but not bad at all. Like he, you know, they weren't rated as aggressive. So, but the thing is, you got to look at this as an additive trait set because I've seen some giant colonies that are the most gentle ever, super productive and are tip top VSH scores. And then I've seen some too that were big, productive tip top VSH scores and they do not want you messing around in there. So that it's just selection, man. I mean, you can stick it in anything. I'm moving towards this and getting away from this. So if you find that you have a bunch of daughters and you got a few of them that are aggressive, you know, shy away from them, breed this direction because you can manipulate it either way. You know, if we can breed timber wolves to look like pugs, dogs that sit on your couch we can breed a mite resistant bee that's going to do what we need it to do and you know i think i'm just getting started so i think we can improve it a lot better too but it's already working one of my problems these south alabama feral colonies around here south alabama mutts so to speak are they're kind of have a reputation (laughs) and it's the local right here in this town in this area where i live it seems like uh the feral colonies are quite, you know, they're not all that way, but a lot of them are quite spicy. It's just how yeah. they are. And yeah. so, you know, if I, you know, that's how I built my initial uh, stock when I started beekeeping was, you know, my mentor, I got some colonies from him and he told me from the start, he's like, Bruce, there's nothing wrong with having bees that are defensive. You want them to be able to defend against predators or other situations that happen. And so, but, it, but he doesn't work here. He works his without anything. And now they'll sting him in the face or in the hand a little bit here or there. So they're not horrible. I mean, yep. they're workable, but they are a little bit defensive. And so that's kind of where I started. And, and he just, he sold me some bees and some queens. He used to make queens just from local stuff like his bees, whatever he had, the genetics. And then he would, you know, breed and, and a lot of really good bees, but just, you know, they have a defensive tendency. Yeah. And then I built my stock a lot from just catching swarms. Cause that's really cool to do, especially when you're a new beekeeper, you just want to catch swarms cause it's so much fun. And I still catch them occasionally. And so I, you don't know what you're getting when you do that. You really don't know. We are right here on the Florida line, and I know they've had some issues with with uh, some some uh, possibly some Africanized stuff down in mm-hmm. South Florida. I don't know if they've had any up here right in Northern Florida. There's so many commercial beekeepers uh, just south of the line here in Florida that are that have you know they have intentional breeding, so they, they that doesn't create a great atmosphere for Africanized bees to move up this way, but. But they're, they're just, some of them are a little chippy, a little feisty. Not all of them. Now I go through a bee yard and even before I started kind of bringing in some outside queens a little bit more like I've done the last couple of years. And it'll be, say there's 10 colonies, you'll have eight that are fine and two that'll just, they'll staple your pants to your ankles, you know, that kind. And so it's like, it's like, um, and it seems like that's kind of how it's been. And so people watch my videos like, man, your bees are so mean. I'm like, well, no, it's just, there's a couple of them that are, and you learn to work that colony last, because if you work them first, they'll follow you all the way around the bee yard the whole time you're there. So, but my goal is in, in my whole situation, the reason I haven't sold a lot of nukes or a lot of Queens is because I don't want to sell bees to new beekeepers or anyone hobby beekeepers particularly i think commercial guys can kind of learn to deal with it but but your 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 hobby people or anyone that that is expecting to see what you see when you watch university of guelph on on youtube where the bees they work them without anything uh, on you know in shorts out there just maybe it may be a veil um i don't want people to expect that and then get into bees and just be attack so to speak and so my i'm a little hesitant i'm nervous about it i don't want to sell queens to people or bees to people that that's going to be the case and so i have brought in some stock from jose last year i brought in some and, and from uh, greg particularly and, and another friend south of florida here who who um has told me his bees are pretty gentle a couple of them were a little feisty but but uh <laughs> may have been the conditions too uh but in it intentionally to have bees that are gentle i mean not not they don't have to lay down and let me pet their belly be gentle but i do want bees that, that i can get in and and you know if i put a jacket on don't have to worry it, it's a pleasant experience and i'll tell you greg's bees and from what little time they've been in there seem to be that type of bee so my question is i guess roundabout in a roundabout way is if i bring in virgins from you um and i have these other genetics 
you know, here. And some of these bees might have some hygienic or some VSH tendencies already. I don't know. I haven't really checked it the way you're talking about. The mite loads overall seem to be pretty good in my bees, but there's always a mite bomb here or there. I don't know why that is, but that's the case. And so, and I bring in some virgins and they are crossing with the drones from these different sources, you know, and if I can figure out how to eliminate the ones that are the more aggressive, uh, more defensive bees, um, will that, I guess the idea is, can, does it really have, do we get the best of both worlds, so to speak? Yes. Is that what you find? Definitely. Okay. And there's more to it than that, too. Like I mentioned, I, maybe whenever I was talking with Cayman, because um, I'm an animal science major, too, like with agribusiness, if we were taught early on, if you take like a Charlotte bull and breed it, breed it back to Angus cow, cows, you get calves that have heterosis or hybrid vigor. Have you heard of that? Where uh, they I, I kind of know the principle you're talking about. But. They just nurse faster. They just grow quicker. They're just hardier for some reason. It's because you cross two unrelated lines. Well, the same thing happens if I send you virgins and they're mating with what does well or what you like around there. You're getting an immediate cross between, uh, you know, where your localized bees and mine that have been selected for BSH. So immediately you should have amazing brood patterns, even if they're hygienic, which you know, some people are worried about really terrible brood patterns, but I think that's not the norm. I don't agree with that. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. yeah. It, it used to be a problem back in the early days of the VSH breeding program, but they said they just culled those queens and bred it out. And the same thing would apply to you. If you mate 100 daughters or 50 daughters and you find those ones that are just want to staple your pants to your leg, if you cull them or just don't breed from them because they may be the most honey producing things you've seen, which commonly happens occasionally. I, I don't sell as many nukes anymore, but uh, the same thing came to mind because I sold 10 to one of my entomology graduate fellow students. He was wanting to do some research and he has one out of 10 that he's like that one, man, it's just got an attitude. He's like, it's the biggest colony you know, they look amazing, but they just don't tolerate as much tomfoolery, I guess. You can't be yeah. scratching around in there when it's cold. Or like you said, you need to work that they're, colony. They're light. defensive. They're defensive, which once again, I, I'm not I'm not opposed to bees being a bit defensive because we have skunks, we have raccoons, we have, you know, there's just, and we don't have bears here, but I don't know if bears can, if bees can really keep bears out anyway, but we don't have bears here yet. Now there have been some spotted kind of in the, within a, the region but i don't i don't mind if they're willing to defend their hive i just don't want bees that are going to like scare the new bee, newbie away i don't want to do that yeah. and so that that is that answers my question there and and the key is when you say cold when you say cold how do you do that do you actually kill the hive or you just get rid of the queen i just get like, rid of the queen yeah it's that's that's another thing i'm like so many times the big huge nice colonies are the ones that are a little more feisty Rabby, yeah. um, it just seems that way and and people say that mean bees produce more honey that's not necessarily true in all cases yeah. but but many times in my cases the ones that do produce the most honey are the ones that are the most feisty so I, you know i'm just trying to figure all this out figure out where i want to go because i do want to ultimately down the road especially if i can pull away and go full time with this i do want to be able to sell quality local stock there are no local queen breeders right here that do that and so it'd be yeah. great if i could just have some available for the local bee club and, and local people here in this part of the state and, and even the entire state of alabama and uh, also nukes and things like that and um you know i i just i'm interested in maybe trying it out in a bee yard or two and just seeing what happens you know yeah. in the road We're, we we buy cells and and the whole theory behind cells i really love it is that you combine selected stock whatever that stock is with local drones and so you get you know you're bringing hopefully the idea like you said is to bring the traits together yep. i've heard too that attitude is a is a um a result of the drones is there any truth to that or is it just a mix between the two I, I, that doesn't make sense to me it seems like it would be equal genetics from the two so it seems like you got some attitude from the virgin, some attitude from the drones they make with. So I, I've heard that, but I don't know that that is necessarily true. You yeah. all kinds of stuff thrown around out there. I've heard people say that. I mean, maybe there <laughs> is truth to it. I'm aware, not aware of, but I mean, if you just look at basic genetics of how they pair up and if one's dominant or recessive, you know, it wouldn't matter. Whichever one's dominant, it doesn't matter if it comes from the yeah. mother or the father, it's dominant. That's right. So I don't 
I don't put a lot of stock in that. I mean, ge genetics is a lot more complicated than that. So there could be some truth to it. I'm not aware of, but overall, I don't think like certain traits are in the patra line or certain traits are in the matra line. You know, well, whenever you were talking about, I wanted to say one more thing about our previous discussion about aggression. Uh, I said I was becoming an isolationist and I'm not out crossing anything. It seems to me like every year, they're even more back to the original VSH Italians. You could work without a glove and probably wear shorts. So I wouldn't say they're that aggressive. You might have an occasional one pop up that are, but I feel like every year it's more where I want it to be. So yeah, I so, just gave extreme cases, but overall I wouldn't say my stock was aggressive. That's what so, so in this, in, in response, you just mentioned something you haven't outsourced in years. How do you, what are you doing to prevent inbreeding? How do you do that? I use a page laid law closed population breeding model, <laughs> which okay, that, break that break lot. that down break that down in terms that I understand. Okay, you're using yeah. a lot of different queen mothers. You're not just grafting out of one all the time. And I'm using like yards full of colonies that have been tested for drones. So actually, the queens that I'm the breeder queens I'm selling, a lot of them are technically you would call it super mated. You know how they'll mate with 15 to 20 drones? Well, these, I'll catch a, drones from a whole yard, a high score in colonies. I let them mix in a flight cage, so they're mixed up. And then I extract them, which mixes it because you're pushing and pulling to extract semen. So basically, she could be mated to 100 or 200 drones the way that I do that. So there, she's being mated to an unnaturally high number of drones. So that genetic diversity, that's why I was saying you're going to have to work to get inbreeding if you're buying bees from me. And I always have that concern of inbreeding. Sure. I'm like, man, don't even just let that go from your mind. It is not okay. an issue. Okay. But, Sounds good. And now that leads me to maybe we can go on to the next topic. Um, Corey, I'd like to address a little bit, a couple of things here kind of go in different directions, but how do you catch all those drones? It is a good question. There's two ways of doing it. All of the Europeans will make like a flight cage above the colony where they can kind of go towards the light mm -hmm. and swirl around up there. There's the major <laughs> problem with that is poop, honestly. What I do, and this is what I've been, I've been criticized for it, but I learned it from Sue Kobe. So she's internationally known expert on this. It's a double-edged sword. So I have my colonies scattered around where they're not sitting in a row and they're not all painted the same. So you'll cut down on drift, may have a little bit, but I go through and test whole yards for VSH. And then they've got those numbered tree tags on the bottom board. So I know who's who. And then whenever the, it's good drone flight time, we have these entrance excluders. Have you seen those? It's just a piece mm -hmm. of corn excluder with wood around it, and it sh shoves on the entrance. So the workers can go through it, but all the boys flying back from the singles bar okay. are locked out. So they're just – I've got good pictures of that I could send you to where the drones are just caked all over the front because they can't get in. Okay. And so I go through with with drone cages and me and my kids, wife, everybody will just catch cages full of these drones and move around all the colonies that are on our list that scored high. And the other thing to reduce drift of non VSH colonies, if they score low and they're a cull, they usually get queen gets killed. I'll split them and move them to another yard and requeen them. So I'm just getting those colonies out of that yard because there is going to be some drift. You know, sure, absolutely. Yeah. The way but you I mean, you're going to have a little bit. I mean, you may have, if you're mating with a huge number of drones, like you're talking about, if you have one drone in that mix that's not ideal, it's going to greatly be, I mean, that's not going to be a dominant trait in those bees, I don't think. So that that's cool. Yeah. But, but basically, whenever she lays all those mm -hmm. eggs, you might have 2% of those workers be not high VSH. But if you measure that colony, it's going to be VSH all day long. We're just going for odds here. That's what those breeders, the advantage of it, are buying virgins from me is you have a, that pressure, that VSH selection and, and commercial viability too. So you're paying me for selection. And really, if you buy a breeder, you're getting the same. You're using my virgins technically. You're just raising them yourself, but you can do 
ten thousand if you wanted to, and it's sure. the same price. It's been great, and I kind of start to wrap this up a little bit here. And for those uh, who have made it this far, um, if if you're watching this video now, you can go back. If you want to review this, of course, you can go back to the previous segments of this video and uh, watch what we've talked about here. It's been really interesting, Corey. I appreciate it. But I guess in to close it up, I would say, you know, for anyone that's starting out on beekeeping or even those that have been doing it at it for a while, what are your recommendations moving forward um, if we want to introduce more VSH stock? Um, but if you want to develop that, if you want to move forward with your a colony the idea is to become is to help beekeeping move forward if you wanted to provide a strategy i guess for someone like me or anyone that's that's interested in developing these traits or having a more vsh stock even if they want to have maybe some traits from different queen breeders around there that they like or maybe their own bees they really like yep. uh give us a strategy for exactly kind of how you would approach that um and uh just kind of roll with it and let us know what you would do and i may try exactly what you recommend here yeah, I would recommend supporting people that are doing the work first and foremost, because you don't have to necessarily. I mean, it may cost you a little bit up front, but you can buy highly concentrated whatever you're after. If it's Caucasians, you know, Bob's got some cool Caucasians, uh, whatever you're after. If you're after VSH, you know, there's a small number of people that are doing this. Hopefully it grows and I think it will grow. But uh, uh, I would just say support people that are doing the work and, you know, everybody's got their own selection. So they're all going to be a little bit different and just, you know, support people that are doing the work and, and have what you want to add. Or if you want to be the one doing the work, you know, I've got some how to videos out there on how to do a Harbo assay. My channel's not real cool. I'm not real big, but I've got some in informative stuff out there. So you can check out Steven's Beco if you want to do Harbo assays. Um, I just want to encourage people to be breeding bees that are commercially productive but are still mite resistant. So, I mean, you're welcome to hit me up if you got questions or whatever, but the most straightforward route, and that's the route I took back in the day, I wanted VSH. I knew Tom Glenn, that was his game. That's what he was doing. And I ordered those. And exactly like you, I opened, made a dose to my Missouri mutts that I had. <clears throat> and it was the closest thing to an unkillable bee that I've run across. They were just productive and they were outcrossed with my local mutleys and they were just rugged. And then you can select from that and go your own direction if you want. Or again, you know, if you're starting to get muddy, you're starting to see more mite issues. You're starting to have some viral issues. So you think it's getting muddy. If you don't want to do the selection work, you know, back to uh, support your breeders that are doing the work. And I, I, I'm looking to leave my day job in the near future, which is kind of a leap of faith, I guess, because I've got a comfortable corporate job. I don't even leave the house for, but I'm not, I'm not a sit at a computer guy, Bruce. I'm a get out in the field. I'm from farming stock. And so I'm trying to get back out in the field where I belong and also not starve to death. So I hear you, man. <laughs> Supporting your local breeder. Uh, you know, if, if I've got something you're interested in, check it out or give it a shot and i'm looking to, for continuous improvement too i've started a breeding group with some of my commercial friends that are running you know a lot of colonies and uh they're getting breeders just running the heck out of them and then they're sending me back some f1 daughters so it's been commercially tested they just run them how they run them you don't have to not treat them just do what you do do normal stuff and just run the heck out of them so instead of testing you know, or working with 150 colonies, I might be working with 10 plus thousand colonies. And I want to develop that even further, basically have a network breeding to where, you know, we're testing stuff on a massive scale. And then I'm able to test the mite resistance so they don't have to fool with it. They can do what they do. I'll do what I do. And then we can both win. But more, more to come on that, Bruce. I, that's as far as I've gotten with it. I'm doing it this year with like I said, a handful of people that I know and trust and they're solid people with good character. And, but I want to expand that out too. So, you know, sure. Get on my website and subscribe. If you'd like to get email updates, I don't send a bunch of spam, but I will send more details out on that as it evolves. So if you're interested in that. You know, right. Um, so how, like, if I want to like, just say this year in the next year or two, if I want to do this, 
walk me through what I need to do yep. to get to get some of your queens, to get some of your stock introduced into my stock. Kind of walk me step by step what the process is. Yep. With uh, my number one option this year, because my breeders are limited uh, due to that project and a couple other factors. So I'm just selling a ton of virgin queens out of my breeders. So I would say if you want to try them, sample them, you know, dip your toe in the water, or if you want to just order a hundred and do a whole yard of them, totally up to you. But I would say order virgins. And I know historically the commercial crowd will turn their nose up to virgins but years ago, around 2015 or so, I figured out a way that virgins were accepted really well. And it was a roundabout way. <clears throat> I would hold them in their nuke. I was holding them for insemination. So they, you know, I want them to, they were already introduced. They already knew her. They'd been feeding her. Then I inseminate her and I'd put her back in there and they'd kill her. Well, every time I noticed, I went back in there doing a uh, crime scene investigation and they all had queen cells. So I was like, okay, well, we can play this game if you want. I'll just wait till you don't have the colony doesn't have anything they can make a queen out of. So that's like seven to nine days after you split it, because I'm inseminating them on day nine or ten. I would cut all those cells out, and they're kind of hopelessly queenless. They still have open old brood, and they still have cat brood, so they're tight and cohesive. But they would take those queens so much better. And then I figured out it worked for virgins too. And it actually works for cells and mated queens too. If you want to eliminate the competition, pull it above an excluder or split it and move it to another yard, feed it if you want to reduce stress, wait seven to nine days, cut those cells and go around and stick candy cage virgins in there. <clears throat> and it's not uncommon to have a hundred percent take, but I wouldn't expect that to be keeping. You sure, know, more but realistic. So that 70 so or 80 percent that's an interesting approach so ideally because what i traditionally do is do the splits on a saturday a friday or saturday and then the next day drop cells in there but what your recommendation would be is do the splits one weekend and then come in the next weekend kill all the cells and uh drop the drop the ver drop the uh, cells in yeah. cells yeah, or right. virgins or mated queens in the colony yeah. a week later Definitely. And wow. you'll have a better take, actually, because I've even done a side by side. Now it was a small study, you know, less than 20 colonies in each group. But I held virgins for a week. I went ahead and put them in there. I just split them and stuck them in there. But I capped the candy. I waited seven days and I came in with a whole new batch of splits and put, you know, the, within within 24 hours, they had cells in them. And then I cut all these and released them cut all the cells in the virgin batch and pulled all the candy caps. I came back, every single one of the virgins made it. And the queens, I even cheated. I opened them up to make sure the cells were viable. And they were wigglers. They were good queens. I came back and they'd killed every single one of those cells I put in there and they made emergency cells. On the ones that you did, you put in quickly after the split. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, that's standard practice for most commercial yeah. guys. And yeah, I yeah. accept that some of them are going to be emergency queens it's just a numbers game but uh, and that's a small sample size so that may not happen every time but i was pretty disappointed at how many of those queens because i want those genetics i'm a breeder i don't just want a queen in there i want traceable genetics in there so that threw me for a major loop yeah yeah okay that was, well that's that's something i'm going to consider because last year we did some early splits we got some sales and i've started i've started doing a lot of splits with sales and because yeah. um, it's just it's just Economic. affordable really affordable what i what i did was on one day we i made the splits we split everything you know i didn't even look for a queen just split all the hives that were strong enough all the colonies that were strong enough dropped a queen cell in every single one i knew the ones that had queens in them already would work it out like they may kill her then whatever happened and then and the new ones the thought was they would accept the new queen but it took some of those colonies <clears throat> normally you go back in two to three weeks you got eggs it took some of those colonies like a month before they had it straightened out. What happened is they probably just killed that virgin and then made their own queen with emergency cells. Is that what you, what your theory is? Absolutely. And that's the thing is a lot of my buddies are commercial, so they're going to hammer me and go, that's ridiculous. That's a whole nother step with introducing these queens. You're adding exponential labor costs. And then I figured that out. I'm like, yeah, but do you want those queens or do you want emergency queens? I guess the question is, is it really an extra step though? If you have to go back the next day and I mean, just wait a week and do it. I mean, honestly, so I've got some, we have some sales coming, um, 
first week in March, I may, I don't know, I may try that. I may try and break out some splits the previous week and just give it a shot. It, it can't hurt. I and mean, you can not? just check all your brood out. Like if you've got double dupes, you can check all those brood frames off and just put an excluder in there and then let the bees come back through it. And then that whole top box, you know, is queenless. So you could do that a week prior, come back, and whenever you're making your splits out of those frames, knock all the cells down, move them or do whatever you're going to do, and then go through with virgins or cells. You're talking there. about the box that's on top? You can yeah. do that? Above so can you put the virgins in right then as soon as you pull it off? You can, but you better tape over the candy or put a cap on them because they'll take excellent care of them. But if they've got something they can make cells out of, they'll as soon as she's out, they want to kill her. But as long as you keep her in there, they'll take care of her most all the time. Well, here's another thing about that, Bruce. I called that the Stevens method of introduction. But there's something I found out about it, and this was in retrospect. If you look at colonies that are about to swarm, so this is in nature when you got virgins that are introducing into new into colonies, brand new. What happens before they're about to swarm? What does the old queen do? She shuts not. down laying. She shuts down laying, she right? She shuts down laying. So a lot of time in nature, whenever those virgins come out, they've got open old brood and they got cat brood. They don't have anything to make a queen out of. So it actually, I was mirroring nature and I didn't even know it. I was just doing it mechanically and thought I'd won the game. And I actually ended up matching nature. And okay. that because a lot of times when those virgins are coming out, that queen quit laying a while back so she could skinny up and fly. And then whenever okay. those things are coming out, it's exactly the scenario I was creating. So it, so, the, it so that's sense. truly hopelessly queenless is when you have no opportunity for them to make a queen. Right. Now, and some there's... people think hopelessly queenless, because I kept saying this to Sue Kobe, and she would shake her head no. And I said something to – I told it to Bob, too. That's how I knew it was totally new, because he's an old school wisdom. He's done it all, and I told him that. And he's shaking his head no, like this is some foreign concept. It yeah well it's it's non-traditional and, and if there's one thing i think that i like about maybe how i want to be but i know cayman is this way you're this way you know even some of the guys that you know like bob and ian some of these big time beekeepers they've had to be this way some in the past maybe they're in their groove now but you got to test the limits a little bit you got to try some new things and, and how is beekeeping ever going to change or get better if people aren't testing the limits and sometimes you're going to fail Oh, yeah. sometimes you're, <laughs> yeah. but sometimes you're going to come across a method that that works really well for you but just some things that that you learn if you're willing to try new things and so oh, yeah. it sounds like you are and i've always tried to pride myself in the willingness to do that sometimes it's really bit me in the tail and um you know i, I get nervous about things but but i'm willing to be the guinea pig so to speak a little bit here and there and so I, it doesn't bother me too much to do that it would bother me more if it was my main you know hustle if it was my main job i would be probably a little more cautious but since it is a side hustle i'm more willing to go out there and risk some things at times and and it's paid off more often than not it's paid off in a positive manner for me so um but yeah that introduction method I, i'm you know i would encourage folks who heard that who you know if if you want to try it it's worth giving a shot it sounds completely different and opposite of maybe what you've heard in the past but but uh, if you don't want to try it, don't try it you know, don't, don't not Corey for it, but if you want to try it, maybe it'll help. Maybe it'll be a successful thing. And I may give it a shot here with some of these, these new Queens coming in. Well, I look forward to talking to you more in the future, Corey. Um, probably going to try some of your stock this year or soon, but I really appreciate you joining me today. This, we, sure. we talked before, but we were going to spend a, about 30 to 40 minutes and well, it's just, know. it's almost impossible to talk bees like this without just really going down just different rabbit holes, so to speak. Yeah. But, but in order to get a really comprehensive understanding, sometimes you have to discuss different topics. You can't just keep it real superficial and really understand what's going on. Now I have a much better understanding. Hopefully those watching the video will as well. Yeah. Uh, but I appreciate your time. Do you have any final thoughts for us? No, not necessarily. I think we covered it pretty good. You're welcome to, you know, check out my website or shoot me an email. If I'm not, if I wasn't clear on something, you need clarification. What well, just uh, contact me and I'll, I'll do my best with it. And, what is your email, Corey? You mentioned earlier, what is it? it? It's just my last name, Stevens B co at Gmail and our websites. That's the same Stevens B co.com. And now you do have a YouTube channel. It's the same as well, isn't it? Stevens yeah, B company. B. Yeah. It's not like a, it's not near as cool or as large as Bruce's, but I'm just trying to put uh, educational content. I had people pushing me 
you need to write a book on queen rearing or you need to write a book on this. And I'm terrible about just sitting and doing it. But I love having these conversations like this because it's sure. even more creative and interesting for me. And Absolutely. Just cataloging some of that on there. So you might find some useful stuff. And this is a little bit of a, a pioneering adventure for me as well because i've never done just a recording like this of an interview so you're the first oh, i did cool. the i did the one live out you know with tom the other day but as far as getting on like this way remotely and doing this it's my first time doing this and i thought i think it's gone well and i really appreciate your information Corey. and i guess we'll close it out thanks for coming and joining us and y'all take care be safe and we'll catch you on the next one thanks for having me bruce